Welcome everyone back to another video. Recently, one of my viewers kindly asked me to solve this integral, which is what I will be doing today. Luckily for us, this integrand does have an elementary antiderivative, so we can simply find that antiderivative, then apply our bounds, and evaluate the integral via that method. So let us get started with the first part. How do we find the antiderivative of this function? Well, let's think about our integration techniques. Maybe u sub could work here, maybe integration by parts, hopefully not trig sub. Well, when I look at this integrand of this function, I instantly see partial fractions. I think we can decompose this function into some partial fractions, then just use the sum of the integrals, and that would be basically our method of solution. So let's try it. Let's try to decompose this fraction into other fractions. So let's have this 1 over x squared times x minus 1 equal to some, I guess we could have three fractions, but I'll just go with two. Let's try a over x squared plus b over x minus 1, which is going to equal a times x minus 1, then plus b times x squared, and then over our common denominator. So we want this part right here, a times x minus 1 plus b times x squared, to be equal to 1. So a times x minus 1 plus b x squared must be equal to 1. And we have to find such values of a and b, which are numbers, not other functions of x. So how would we do that? Does that even seem possible? Well, look, here we have an x squared, and here we have an x. This is of degree 2, this is of degree 1. So there doesn't seem to be any possible way that we can multiply them by such scalars, such that the second degree will cancel out to a first degree to result in a zero degree. Hmm. So this is not possible. We can decompose this fraction into such a form of a plus b. How about we try three fractions? Maybe we write this 1 over x squared times x minus 1 as 1 over x times x times x minus 1. And then we'll have an a, b, and c such that a over x plus b over x plus c over x minus 1 equals our fraction. So then we have to do a bunch of cross multiplication. And again, if we do this, if we do this whole process, we will get some non-matching degrees for our polynomials. So we cannot possibly pick such numbers for a, b, and c, such that these polynomials will cancel out to 1 because they will be of different degrees. Not possible. So what can we really do here? We can do our partial fractions our normal way. We'll have to think of some trick. So I will show you really a clever part in making this integral much easier to evaluate. When we're having such issues with the integrand, it's usually not our problem, but the integrand's problem. So what we should do is try to rewrite this integrand into a more accessible form. So we're going to rewrite this function with a very simple transformation. We're going to multiply both the numerator and the denominator of it by x, getting us x over x cubed times x minus 1. Now, I don't know why you would have this idea right away, because it's a very strange one, but following out through this procedure, converting this integrand into three partial fractions, you will get a very nice result, which will be very easy to integrate. So follow with me here. This function x over x cubed times x minus 1, we propose that it could be written as a sum of three fractions, a over x squared plus b over x, and then plus c over x minus 1. Now this looks pretty bad, but notice what happens when we proceed with the multiplication. Let's try the a and b first to get ax plus bx squared, then over x cubed, of course, and then plus the lonely c x minus 1. And then we can multiply once again to get a x times x minus 1, then plus b x squared times x minus 1, and then plus c x cubed. And all of this will be over our original denominator of x cubed times x minus 1. So what this means is that this whole numerator right here of our a, b, and c should be equal to x. So let's do that and also clean up these. Uh, fractions with the distributive property real quick. So we get a times x squared minus x right here, then plus b times x cubed minus x squared, and then plus c times x cubed. This all should be equal to x. We have to choose such a, b, and c, which are numbers such that this is equal to x. And then we'll have a very nice solution to our antiderivative. 
choosing such a, b, and c is actually really simple. Notice how the only x term in our entire expression on the left is right here with the coefficient a. So the only possible way we can even dream of getting x on this side is to make this a coefficient negative 1, because then this right here will be equal to x, and none of the others have that x term. So what's our first choice? Let's have our first choice be a to be minus 1. Once we do that, we get minus x squared, then plus x, and then plus all the other stuff, x cubed minus x squared with b, and x cubed with the c. So now, this is another really nice thing to notice. We have two x squared terms and two x cubed terms. So they have a chance of canceling out if we choose the right signs for them. So all the others, b and c, must be a 1 or a negative 1, we see. And now we can precisely identify which ones they will be. For b, we have to choose minus 1, we have to choose the negative 1, because here x squared will become positive and will cancel out with this negative. So our next choice for b will be negative 1. So we get minus x squared plus x, then minus x cubed plus x squared. These will be removed. And then plus c times x cubed. c has to be positive because here we have a negative x cubed and we want only x to remain. So our final choice for c will be of 1. And so we get plus x cubed. And these also cancel out. And we get that x is equal to x. So these are, in fact, the right choices for our partial fraction decomposition. Now we can simply find the antiderivative because we have shown that the integral we want is the same as this integral, but with the partial fraction decomposition for this function is going to be of minus 1 times x squared, sorry, over x squared, then minus 1 over x, and then plus 1 over x minus 1. And so we can simply use the sum of integrals and get by individually getting each one. This minus 1 over x squared, its integral is 1 over x. Of this one, minus 1 over x, that's just the logarithm of the absolute value of x. And this one's also a logarithm, but with the substitution x minus 1. It's going to be plus the logarithm of the absolute value of x minus 1. And with our bounds from 1 to infinity. Now that we found the antiderivative, let's proceed to actually computing these bounds and seeing what they mean. The first thing I actually do here is to simplify the sum of logarithms into a product, just to make it a bit easier to look at. So we will have the same 1 over x, but then plus the logarithm of the absolute value of x minus 1 over x. Here we have a negative, here a positive. And then with our bounds. But what's really concerning about these bounds now is that, well, we obviously can't plug in infinity, but also we can't plug in 1. Because if we plug in 1, we get this logarithm of 0, which does not exist. This is what makes the integral an improper integral. It means that it must be evaluated in terms of limits. So we can use the evaluation theorem on this just fine, but in terms of limits instead of actual function values. So let us do just that. This integral with this bounce is going to be the limit as some t approaches infinity of this function, 1 over t plus ln of t minus 1 over t. And then it's going to be subtract, we're going to subtract from it the limit as t approaches 1, this function, just the evaluation theorem, but with limits instead of values. Limit of t approaches 1 of this function, 1 over t plus ln of t minus 1 over t. We can then use the sum of limits property to evaluate each of these four limits separately. So we're going to get for the first one. The first three are actually all really simple. I won't go over them much. t approaches infinity 1 over t, that's 0. Then as t approaches infinity of this logarithm, well, we can simply put the limit inside what is in this logarithm. Get that this is 1. The logarithm of 1 is 0. And then this next one minus the limit 1 over t. t approaches 1, that's just minus 1. And then we get minus the limit as t approaches 1 of this logarithm t minus 1 over t in absolute value bars. Now this is a bit of a trickier one. We can solve this limit by splitting it up onto the left and right side. So for the right side limits, we can approach it a bit more intuitively now. So t approaches 1 from the right of this logarithm. Well, think about it. As t approaches 1 from the right side, this number in the numerator is going to be a very small positive number. And this number in the denominator is going to be something very close to 1. Small number over 1 is another very small number. 
What happens to logarithms as they approach a very small number? They swoosh down to negative infinity. So this will be equal to negative infinity. Now for the left side limit, it's going to be basically the same thing. The limit as it approaches from the left of this logarithm. Now think about it this way. We get a number in the numerator that is a very small negative number. And here is also going to be a very small number that's close to 1. But remember, here we have our absolute value bars. It does not matter that it is negative. Because still, using the absolute value, it will become again a positive number. And then divided by something close to 1, it again is a very small number. What happens to the logarithm for small numbers? It switches to negative infinity. How nice! Both of these limits are negative infinity. Therefore, this limit as it approaches 1 without left or right is also negative infinity. And now, since we're subtracting this logarithm, it's in our evaluation theorem being subtracted, this is going to be 0 for 0 minus 1, all doesn't matter. This is a negative negative infinity. It becomes a positive infinity. And now that means our integral is divergent, and it diverges in the positive direction. One last note before we end the video. Say you have some function of x, which is going to be our integral from x to infinity. We can simply use the evaluation theorem, use this limit right here, which comes out to 0. And so this function will equal to the negative of this function, which is our antiderivative. So it's going to equal negative 1 over x, and then negative the logarithm of x minus 1 over x. And then we can transform this negative inside the logarithm to get the positive logarithm of x over x minus 1 and then minus 1 over x. Now, why didn't I use the limit? Well, because 1 is not included in the domain of our function. In fact, the domain of our function is going to be from 1, not included, to infinity. And why not less than 1, you ask, because this clearly evaluates at less than 1. Remember our original function. It has an asymptote, a vertical asymptote at 1. And we cannot integrate a function that is not continuous. So we cannot choose anything less than 1 to be our lower bound. So that is it for today's video. Hope it helped the person who commented. Now you know your integral indeed diverges. Stick around next Wednesday to see a part 2 on my series on continued fractions. And meanwhile, go watch the first part of the continued fraction series. That is it. Bye.